Hi, welcome to the first lecture in the YouTube video series on electromagnetics. The thing I would like to cover first in this video series is why you should even be studying electromagnetics in the first place. For many of you who are watching, this is because you're a student, an engineering student, who's being forced to take an electromagnetics course, or perhaps you're in physics. Uh, some of you may be engineers returning and trying to pick up on this after a long time away because you slept through or didn't attend your course in college. And the reason that you're doing this is because electromagnetics is hard. It's often the make or break course in many engineering programs. There's a lot of math, it's arcane, it's abstract, it's difficult to follow in many cases. And essentially what happens is that it's very hard to get your head around what's really going on with all this mathematics that you tend to get immersed in. So what this video series is going to do is try to cut to the chase, do the mathematics because that's necessary to understand it, but really get to the concepts, the fundamental idea of what's going on, which often all call tricks. But before we get started with all of this, let's do a quick review and let's start to see sort of the force of electricity, why it's important, and really how much power is locked into it. So for that, let's take a 100-watt bulb, something you might find in your house. Um, these are at least used to be pretty common. They're phasing them out right now. And let's take the electrons, or the electricity that flows into this bulb, for about one second in time. Now it turns out that a 100-watt bulb, at typical 100 volts in your house, corresponds to about one amp of electricity. Over one second, this is about a coulomb's worth of electricity. A coulomb is a measure of charge that corresponds to a very, very large number of electrons, over 6 times 10 to the 19th. And if you calculate the electric field, and don't worry about this equation, we're going to cover all this stuff later, so if you don't know this stuff, it doesn't matter. But if you calculate the electric field for the amount of charge, which is represented by the variable Q here, for some distance r, we can use this equation to calculate what the electric field is. But, but what is the electric field? Well, let's pick a cool number for the electric field. Let's pick an electric field of 1 million volts per meter. And this is a cool number because this is about what it takes to break down air. It's required for giant sparks and lightning and all the cool stuff about electricity that we so rarely get to see when we're taking a math intensive course. So if we want to go and we want to calculate, if we want to set E, the electric field, to 1 million volts per meter, and we have a charge Q of one coulomb. What's R? In other words, at what distance would one coulomb of charge create a lightning bolt? Or how long of a lightning bolt could it possibly create if we could actually collect a coulomb of charge and put it in a bottle? Well, it turns out when you work all these numbers out, the distance is 95 meters. So the amount of electricity that is used to power a 100-watt light bulb in one second, if you could collect just that charge and hold it in your hand or put it in one place, you would ionize the air for nearly a football field around you and create lightning bolts over that distance. Another way to think about this, to really get a handle on the power of electricity, if you can separate charges, which unfortunately in real life you can't because then electrical engineers would really be badass, is to think about essentially two light bulbs or two of these bottles of charge separated by a little over the length of a football field or 100 meters. It turns out that when you collect two types of charge of the same type, they tend to push each other apart. And this bigger, more complicated equation right here is essentially the force with which these two bottles of charge, the amount of charge used to power a 100 watt light bulb in your home over one second, would push each other apart if we could actually do that. And it turns out that number is 900,000 newtons, which is metric for 200,000 pounds of force. That's a lot of force. To give you a sense, really, of what this is, it corresponds to half of the power put out by one of the engines on the space shuttle. Think about that. The amount of electricity we could collect in one second for a light bulb and then another second for another light bulb has the potential to create a force pushing those two bottles of electricity apart over the distance of a football field with half the force that one of the three engines of the space shuttle puts out. That's an immense amount of power. So how do we unlock this? How do we start to figure out how we work through the math and work through the concepts, the ideas that I'll often call tricks, that really let us understand this, to see behind the mathematics? 
Unfortunately, in order to do that, we assume you know some stuff. There's some stuff you either need to know or at least have seen before because we're going to cover a lot of it as we go through. Um, some of this is basic electric circuits. You know what a resistor, a capacitor, and inductor is, and you can do simple schematic diagrams. You know how to draw a resistor and a capacitor, for example. That's pretty easy. You need to know something about waves. So when I talk about amplitude and phase and frequency, you can picture in your head what I'm talking about. Another is math, because we're going to go through math. And we're going to cover a lot of the math as we go along. But we assume you have some familiarity with algebra. You know what complex numbers are. You've at least used vectors in your physics class. You have some idea of derivatives and integrals and what they do in calculus. And a little bit of familiarity with differential equations, because differential equations really underlie pretty much everything we do. You don't need to be able to solve the bloody things, just to be able to write them and kind of understand them. You also have to have an idea of numbers, of orders of magnitude, how big things are, what's a big number, what's a small number, because we're going to be working with numbers that are so big it's really hard to get your mind around them, and all so small it's almost impossible to physically realize what they are. And of course you have to know how to write these very large and very small numbers in terms of, of engineering or scientific notation. And then you also need to know your units, your MKS units, because that's what you're gonna, we're going to use here, meter, kilogram, second, and how to do unit analysis. So if you have an equation, how to write all the units out longhand and cross them out to make sure your answer is in the units you expect it to be. So with that basic background and that little introduction to why electricity can be really cool, the brief outline of what we're going to talk about is here. I'm going to start with a couple talks that's just an introduction and review of some of the elements math and some of the concepts. We're going to learn about why wires at high frequencies don't act like simple wires anymore. We're going to have a little tutorial on mathematical foundations of electromagnetics, which is also called vector calculus. And this is just the language we need to know how to speak and be comfortable with in order to understand this. So we're going to teach mathematics like you might teach a language. We're going to study electrostatics, which is usually where you kick off your electromagnetics course. And these are just charges that are standing still. And try to grasp these conceptually and see what they mean. Magnetostatics, which is just electrostatics but with magnetic fields. It's really exactly the same thing, but the language is very different. And this can also be a little bit hard to grasp your head around. If, Like when you were a kid, like I was, you thought ma magnets were magic. I mean, how do these bloody things hold together and push it themselves apart without having batteries or anything like that? And we'll explain some of that as we go through there. And then we're going to end up with the really useful part of this, but we have to have all the first stuff in order to understand it, of electromagnetic electric fields and magnetic fields that change with time. And this is how we can send energy through space, how we send information through space, how optical fibers work, in other words, what light is, what radio waves are, and all the stuff that's really germane to understanding our wireless, deeply connected world in which information is traveling back and forth all the time. So hopefully that's useful. Hopefully that whets your appetite. And we're going to outline all of our talks by giving them a number corresponding to these sections. And so hopefully you'll be able to jump around and figure out what you need, when you need it for the class you're taking or the review you need to do without watching the whole bloody series back to back.